In this video, we take a look at the need for encryption and to discuss two types, symmetric and asymmetric. So what exactly is encryption? Well, it's the process of encoding a message so it can be read only by the sender and the intended recipient. And encryption has been around for as long as we've been producing written communications. In today's modern age, where we easily and freely share vast amounts of information in electronic form, there are a number of types of personal and sensitive information which we may want to be encrypted. One of the first forms of encryption was the Caesar cipher, which replaces each letter of the alphabet with another letter a fixed distance away from the original. To decrypt the message, the recipient needs to know how many places the alphabet has been shifted. This is known as the key. If the recipient knows the key, they can decrypt the message. Of course, this sort of encryption is very easy to crack even without the key. The ultimate aim of encryption is to make the original message impossible to crack without knowing the key. With symmetric encryption, a single key is used to both encrypt and decrypt the message. When using this method, both parties need to know the key and both need to keep it secret. The same key can be used multiple times. Alternatively, a unique key could be generated each time in an attempt to make it harder to crack. However, with symmetric encryption, there is always the danger that a message can be cracked by either interception of the key or duplication of the key production process to require a copy. Because of this, systems that send or receive sensitive information, like payment card details, use a far more secure method of encryption known as asymmetric encryption. Let's take a look at that now. So with asymmetric encryption, we use two different keys. We start with the unencrypted message and encrypt it with the first key. Once the message is sent, the recipient then decrypts the message with a second key. The important thing to note is the key used by the sender to encrypt the message is not the same as the one the recipient uses to decrypt it. It's also virtually impossible to derive one key from the other, making asymmetric encryption a much more secure method. The keys are generated so anything encrypted with one of the keys can be decrypted with the other and together these keys form what we call key pairs. For asymmetric encryption to work, we need to pick one key from the key pair and make it our public key. The other becomes our private key. As the name suggests, the public key can be made public. You can give it out and publish it online, Public keys are actually often stored in secure servers known as key safes in the cloud. The point to note is that anyone can access your public key. However, you should never send your private key to anyone. So how does this public private key method actually help us construct a more secure encryption system? We start by each person having access to their own public-private key pairs, as shown here. The first thing that happens is the sender and recipient exchange copies of their public keys. Now, there's no issue with this, of course, as the public keys are just that, they are public. The keys can be sent via any method. You could literally email them to each other. We don't need to worry about someone intercepting them. If Jane wants to communicate with me privately, she will use my public key, which I sent her, to encrypt her message and send it on to me. I would then use my private key, which I've never sent anyone, to decrypt it. Note how I didn't need to share anything with Jane. I didn't need to worry about someone else intercepting the message. They can't decrypt it about my private key anyway, which of course I've been keeping safe at my end and never sending out. Now, there's another huge advantage to this public private key system. I could choose to encrypt my message with my private key and then send it out. 
Now, you might be thinking, why on earth would I want to do that? We've already said anyone can access my public key. So by doing this, presumably anyone can decrypt my message. This seems a little backwards. The fact, however, that my message can be decrypted with a copy of my public key means it must have originally been encrypted with my private key. This means the message can be confirmed, it can be seen as being authentic. It must have originated from me and not somebody else. Now this final bit of information brings us to the complete solution behind asymmetric encryption. So if I want to send a message, I would actually use my private key and my copy of Jane in this case, public key. This is often referred to as a combined encryption key. I would use this combined encryption key to encrypt the message and send it on its way to Jane. To decrypt the message, Jane would then need to use her private key and her copy of my public key. The beauty here is we now know four things. I know that no one else will be able to read my message. Jane knows that no one else can read my message. Jane knows that she can be sure the message is authentic. And finally, she can also be sure the message hasn't been modified in transit. Here's a summary of what we've discussed. Pause the video and take some notes. Well, that's all you need to know for the actual exam. Um, however, if you're interested, we've got another short section on actually how easy is it to crack a modern encryption key. So what actually is an encryption key and how easy could they be to crack? Although we've been talking in the abstract terms of a physical key, what they actually are is literally a sequence of alphanumeric characters. A popular current standard at the time of making this video was the 256-bit encryption key, and there's an actual example of it represented in hexadecimal. It's literally a string of alphanumeric characters. Now, with a 256-bit encryption key, there are that many possible combinations. I can't pronounce that number, obviously. It's the one in orange, and that's a 78-digit number. If we were to try and brute force attack that, to trial the combinations to crack my key, we'd have to try all two to the power of 256 possible combinations. Now, in reality, on average, we'd say a hacker wouldn't need to try every combination. They typically only need to try about half of them for it to be checked. But even so, with the most powerful computers available today, it's commonly understood that it would take billions of billions of years to crack. In fact, an analogy you often find around the internet is it would take longer to crack than the current age of the universe.